right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have all of you here. Good evening, good morning, wherever you may be calling in from. We are very grateful that you decided to join us here this evening for a webinar from the No Fighter Jets Coalition. Um, we're here for a Drop the F-35 Deal, a discussion on Canada's F-35 fighter jet purchase. This evening, we are so, so lucky to be in the company of incredible experts on the subject of the F-35 across North America. Our wonderful uh, moderator, Tamara, will be taking it away in just a moment. Um, but I wanted to take a second to invite you to uh, you know, let us know where you're calling in from in the chat. We'd really like to hear from you. Um, and I'd also just like to go over a few Zoom protocols um, right off the bat, I'd like to let you know that you probably noticed we're on a webinar style uh, Zoom meeting right now, meaning that um, you're unable to unmute yourself or show your video, and that's just to protect us from unfortunate Zoom bombing that does occur in webinars like this sometimes. Uh, during the webinar, we will be also recording this meeting, as you may have noticed as well, and we'll be posting it on YouTube and sending it out to all the registrants, including those who aren't here this evening with us. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to add your questions for the panelists um, in the chat throughout. We'll be having a Q&A session um, towards the end of this event, which we're very excited about too. Um, I'd also like to point out that at the bottom of your screen on your Zoom control panel, you are able to enable closed captioning if that helps you experience this event to the best of your ability. Um, you can click the CC button to enable captions. It is done by robots. It's not perfect. Um, so we hope that that at least helps you a little bit to uh, understand all the, all the wonderful and important things that are going to be discussed this evening. Um, with that being said, I will be turning it over to Tamara. Oh, I didn't even introduce myself. I should also mention that my name is Maya Garfinkel. Um, I'm the World Beyond War Canada organizer. Uh, World Beyond War is an organization dedicated to the abolition of all war, and we'll be talking a bit more about what that means in this context, um, and I'll put a bit more information in the chat as we continue about World Beyond War, um, but we'll also be hearing from folks from a lot of different, different organizations this evening. And for the rest of the event, I'll be sort of behind the scenes, and as of now, I'll turn it over to Tamara. Thank you so much, Tamara. Thank you very much, Maya. And good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. It's wonderful to see people from across Canada and the United States and maybe elsewhere. And as Maya said, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're from and your organization. So I'm speaking to you from Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, Canada, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the neutral peoples. And I would also like to acknowledge that across Turtle Island, Indigenous territory has been militarized, occupied, contaminated, and degraded by Air Force and Army bases and weapons testing sites. Our peace groups stand in solidarity with the Indigenous communities and their demand for land back and reparations. True reconciliation is healing, not harming. So my name is Tamara Lawrence. I'm a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Both of our organizations are members of the No Fighter Jets Coalition. This coalition is comprised of approximately 25 peace and justice groups from across Canada. We are opposed to the Canadian government buying a new fleet of fighter jets. Our coalition was established three years ago after the Trudeau government announced that it would launch an open competition to pick a new fighter jet. Last year in March, the media reported that the federal government had decided to select the F-35 and last month on January 9th, Canada's Defence Minister Anita Anand formally announced that Canada was buying the F-35 and would buy the first block of 16 F-35s for $7 billion, and over the next nine years would be buying the remaining 72 for $12 billion for a total price tag of $19 billion. However, the defense minister did admit that the life cycle costs would be at least $70 billion. The parliamentary budget officer will be doing a life cycle cost analysis and that should be released in the next few months. And this fighter jet purchase 
is the second most expensive procurement in Canadian history. Over the past three years, our coalition has worked very hard to try to stop the Trudeau government from proceeding with this war plane procurement. We have held rallies, webinars, sent letters, had meetings with members of parliament, published articles and reports, re-released open letters with high profile Canadians and celebrities. We have really done a lot um, to try to, to stop it. And it is because of our efforts that the decision has been delayed by 13 years. And we are not stopping with our campaign. Our coalition is going to continue to oppose Canada's purchase of new fighter jets. We are going to um, proceed with our campaign, hashtag drop the F-35 deal. You can follow us on social media. And we are going to try to cancel this in procurement entirely or at the very least try to, um, to limit it to the purchase of the first batch of F-35s. I want to encourage you to speak out, contact your MP and bring to, your bring to their attention um, uh, our campaign and our concerns and some of these important resources. And Maya will put the links in the chat for them. So on our website, nofighterjets.ca, we have a coalition report. Um, from acquisition to disposal, uncovering the true costs of 88 fighter jets. We also have a comprehensive report entitled Soaring, the harms and risks of fighter jets, why Canada must not buy a new fleet. And you can share those with your members of parliament. And finally, I want to urge you to sign our parliamentary e-petition, cancel the F-35s and share it very widely with all of your friends, family and coworkers because we are trying to get to at least 2000 signatures by March 6. So now on to our excellent panel that I'm really looking forward to. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, I want to remind you to put any comments or questions uh, in the chat and you are also invited to share any resources or events that you have. And then after the three panelists uh, speak, we will have about 20, 25 minutes for a discussion. So our first panelist is Paul Mayette. Paul is a retired Air Force Colonel with 25 years as an aerospace engineering officer in the Department of National Defense. He managed the CF-18 uh, fleet during his time with the Royal Canadian Air Force. He also served for four years as uh, the Department of National Defense's Director of Defense Ethics following the Somalia affair. And this year, in fact, uh, marks the 30th anniversary of this really disastrous and deadly Canadian peacekeeping mission in Somalia. And you can do a Google search to find out more. Um, and Paul is now an accredited peace professional. He established the Center for Ethics and Peace Services in Ottawa. And we will put uh, in the chat a link to his website, paulmayetteethics.wordpress.com. Paul, please take it away. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And um, I know this is a huge subject for 15 minutes, but I'll try to do it justice as best I can. Um, in my career, I actually uh, retired about six months before 9-11. And in my career, we had various choices. Uh, we were either uh, peacekeepers, many, many missions. We were either cold warriors uh, in Europe, or we did Canadian sovereignty operations. Following 9-11, there was a pivot in the, in the military to becoming war fighters when they got involved in um, Afghanistan and bombing in Iraq and, and, and Syria. So there was a turn that was taken there, uh, predominantly the work of General, General Hillier at the time. But um, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau came in and uh, did a few things that he promised to do. Uh, he said to the international community, we are back regarding international peace and stability and uh, took out the bombing campaign in, um, uh, that was going on in the Middle East, uh, in Syria and Iraq. So right now, um, basically, we are mostly neither. Uh, the Ukraine war that's going on now is putting a lot of pressure on us uh, to reshape ourselves. So what I would like to say is this, this F-35 is probably something that's going to, in a sense, uh, define Canada and its identity. 
what what do we want to be in this in this uh, global community, and how do we want to contribute to international peace and stability? Do we want to do, be war fighters in a sense, or do we want to be involved in peace operations? And this this is part of the of the opportunity now. Enter the the F-35 into our politics and identity, and what what does this actually mean? And I would I would advance it. There's probably four areas to think about. Um, what what's the mission going on here? Um, uh, the procurement process that happened, uh, the aircraft itself, and then the the political and the public context. Um, with regards to the mission, um, the defense policy paper, strong, secure, and engaged. Uh, really did, in a sense, ignore the, the direction of the Prime Minister regarding international peace and stability, as they just marched on uh, with very, very large and expensive equipment procurements that, that were um, uh, aimed and oriented towards war fighting. Uh, so in the, in the mission context, uh, we have something called the RMA, uh, which is the Revolution of Military Affairs, um, which is now putting a very, very strong sort of emphasis on what's changing uh, and the relevance of these kind of fighters in any sort of, of, of war. You know, we've, we've watched the Ukraine war and we've seen the, the issue of drones, and we've also seen the declining role of fighter aircraft uh, in theater. You don't put a $110 million aircraft uh, into a place where it can be shot down by an eight cent bullet. So you do have that that thing in, that's lurking in the background, and may have and may have some way uh, in in talking about it that may uh, in, influence things. The next thing is procurement, and I think one of the things, and I've been involved in procurement, the F-18, the life cycle manager, um, uh, the rank of colonel, and um, the most important thing in procurement is what's called the SOR, the statement of requirement. And if if we are going to criticize how this competition came out. Um, we have to see the SOR. What were they asking for? It's very, very easy in the SOR to say we've had a fair, open, and honest uh, uh, competition uh, uh, with regards to the statement of requirement if we have slanted the statement of requirement in any way towards stealth or something like this that is going to uh, bias the, the competition towards one candidate or another. So given, given that uh, idea, and we buy, we buy airplanes on the basis of cost performance, uh, schedule industrial benefits, basically. And um, in my view, when I looked at the even the two candidates that were there, um, there is no way the F-35 won on cost. It, this, is, this is absolutely uh, a non-starter. It only won on, it, it hardly won on performance. I mean, the, the idea of the aircraft was initially to uh, replace the A-10 and the F-16, mainly in a ground attack role. So it, it morphed itself. It became too expensive probably to be in that environment. Then it then it decided it wanted to be an air superiority fighter. Uh, and it had neither the range or the payload or or the, the speed uh, to be very good at that. Then if you look at the Boeing website and you see that they are now advertising the F-35 as a node in a battle management system, a critical node in a battle management system that fuses all sorts of sensors from outer space and, and whatever uh, uh, that the United States uh, has uh, that Canada in no way has. So buying that aircraft means we would not get any, just a fraction of the capability unless we want to be another expensive squadron of the US Air Force, US foreign policy. So uh, there is a there is a massive unsuitability that has emerged with regards to this, to this aircraft. Uh, certainly schedule um, the, the J-20 or whatever the other competitions were um, would have a better schedule, uh, produce it quicker. And there really are no industrial benefits. Uh, the industrial benefits of the F-35 is based on competition. Uh, all user countries who have it will compete uh, for, for uh, contracts and there's no guarantees of anything. Uh, you, you win basically on your own merits. So the aircraft does have, uh, you know, exceedingly uh, technical shortcomings, and I won't go into that, uh, uh, just given the time uh, that I have here. Uh, the operational shortcomings uh, are becoming very, very obvious. It's single engine, very low payload, uh, speed, all, all sorts of things that uh, that um, in, inhibit its, its, its full use in a sense. So there is that unsuitability. Then the last thing is the political context. Um, we are now in a situation where, where for some reason, uh, 
after the Trudeau government decided that it would not, under any circumstances, buy this aircraft, they are buying it. And what, where, where is the pressure that's going to come from? Either the United States, the issue of NATO, uh, but basically, fundamentally, at our at our at our level of identity. You know, what do we want to be in the world, and how do we want to contribute to international um, uh, uh, peace and peace and stability? So there is that. Um, the economic trade-offs, when we argue costs, uh, usually don't become compelling. Um, recently, I guess, if you've been watching the news, you've looked at the $300 billion for health care and the $42 billion. So there's going to be an awful lot of stress uh, on the federal government in the out years. And the government has a way of, of, of sort of doing nothing. There's the old adage that says delay is the deadliest form of denial. And uh, I think they've been playing that that sort of card with the United States and just delay, delay. And in that, in that uh, context, it may well be that the deal may die or be deal may be shut down. We've, we've shut down massive programs before. The, the H-101, for example, helicopter, you know, at the cost of, of very, very large cancellation projects. So it, it is not, it, it's not impossible that this, this deal may suffer some hiccups or it may be extended way out. I mean, if you look at the procurement uh, um, uh, wish list of, of the military, you know, they're looking at what, 300 billion for ships, uh, another 5 billion for drones. Uh, so they're going everywhere. And, and it's going to be at some point to decide uh, what's affordable and what's not affordable. So I think there is something there. Uh, and then the last part would be, you know, the, the sort of the, the Canadian values and the moral context that we have there. Um, the, the F-35 is not a peacekeeping, peacekeeping uh, aircraft. It's an aircraft that's designed to uh, drop bombs and kill people. Um, if all we wanted to do was control our airspace, you know, and somebody shows up in the airspace and to be able to go out there and, you know, say, say hello, which is what we did in, in NORAD a lot, and, and monitor that, um, the F-35 is not suitable for that. Uh, there are very, very inexpensive ways that we can do that, similar to the way that Coast Guards patrol the oceans and policemen patrol the streets. And, and then the issue is, is if we do have a concern with regards to the international context, how are we going to, to deal with that? Now, we can make some categorical statements, say, no, we don't want this, we don't want NATO, we don't want whatever. Uh, but at some point, uh, as, a, as a peace professional, we have to decide how we are going to approach this. And the idea being is, is you have choices. I mean, if you if you look at the at the sort of the model that, that occurs, there's a line. Below the line is who you are and your possibilities and realities. And above the line is what you want to uh, to achieve. And then at both ends of the line is the is the spectrum of ways and means that you have to go for. So if we want to achieve human security and peace outcomes, uh, we can do it from the perspective of negative peace which is confrontative and resistive and that kind of thing. Or we can do it from positive peace, which is the domain of negotiation, dialogue, and compromise, knowing that we may not get everything, but we may get something. And something may be the reality that we, that we have to face. So if we're in the domain of positive peace, uh, and this is really the way of, of peace professionals, there's really four things that you have to do in this, in this issue. Uh, one, we have to be present and maintain our presence in the issue very strongly. Um, then the difficult part is we have to be impartial. You know, we have to be able to talk to all sides of the of the coin here, uh, including the military and the politicians, uh, in some way that represents nonviolent communication. The accusations, threats, blames, insults, all this thing, get you nowhere uh, when you're talking to defense. They know the news cycle will last two, three, four days. And they will not respond uh, in that period of time. And if the news cycle doesn't pick it up, it's gone, uh, that kind of thing. And then the other positive piece, end of the line, one, one side is negative piece. The positive piece line is going to be the negotiations, dialogue, con consultation kind of thing. So in the positive piece, you have nonviolent communication, impartiality, the values that we bring, the biases that we, that we bring, do no harm, nonviolence, whatever, and being present. On the negative uh, piece thing, there, there is a, a notion of violence there in terms of confrontation, demands. We are ask, asking for solutions and actions from others, as opposed to what we can do for ourselves. 
And the idea of taking a side as below the line and above the line is some expectation of win-lose rather than win-win. So you have to decide basically uh, where you want to go and what you want to be. So we really are at some sort of nexus of choices, you know, and it, it really it really is uh, an issue and a dialogue of questions, you know, that if uh, one to three, which was um, mission procurement and the aircraft itself is not compelling, uh, then what then four might be the arena for change or at least the the a way forward, at least till till uh, uh, some disaster occurs. But one to three fails because basically they have the power to look the other way. And uh, cost doesn't become a, uh, an issue in some sense. So, um, you know, by way of questions, the, there's the identity of Canada, you know, are we war fighting, or peace building? Uh, is a national, is a nonviolent national defense policy possible? Uh, there are people in the, in the world there that are looking at, at that kind of thing. Uh, you know, what does a nonviolent defense policy look like? That uh, kind of thing. Can we transform the military? Uh, or have them at least meet the peace thing half ways. You know, the balance of introducing uh, at the high levels peace studies and war studies uh, and, and change the definition of, of military victory uh, to one of peace uh, in, in, its, in a sense. And those, those cultural changes can be very, very important. You know, can we influence foreign policy to make the F-35 irrelevant? Uh, engage in disarmament, nuclear weapons, uh, peacekeeping missions like Haiti and these other things uh, that eventually will just allow that the, the other side to wither away at some point. Um, can we even create a Department of Peace uh, under UN uh, Resolution 53243? I belong to an international organization that's dedicated to doing that, creating Departments of Peace, and we are currently working in Colombia after the FARC agreement there, that there was a truth commission and one of the big recommendations of the peace accord was to, to do so. So I'm on a congressional writing team and we're writing the legislation that's going to, to make that happen. And all of these things will massage the environment around the military uh, that's going to make a lot of these things either, either irrelevant or not possible. You know, are there peaceful uh, um, alternatives to NATO contributions? Uh, it, it may be a reality, unfortunate one, that you can't shut down NATO, uh, but can, can we change it in some ways? You know, uh, what, what, what are nonviolent contributions to international peace and security? What actually does that mean? And what equipment do you need to do, to do that kind of thing? So we come down to how we're going to respond. You know, are we going to re respond from the place of angry? Are we going to respond from equanimity? You know, and what what defines us as as human beings when we enter into this sort of situation? Uh, we can look at transactional uh, responses, which of course are peace agreements or hard agreements, or we can look at relational responses, uh, in which we can try to to look at ourselves as Canadians and human beings, and and how we can move forward in a sense. So we probably should pick the issues we can succeed at, uh, issues that have a reasonable uh, probability of success, uh, issues that are going to massage the meta environment around the military, maybe change it a bit, um, maybe change the business of um, you know, military officers. That the, that the business of the military is to prepare for war and win on the battlefield, um, as opposed to whoops, my uh, 15 minutes there. Uh, as opposed to, if you want peace, work at it. Uh, and th they, that could establish a, a hard and, and lasting cultural change that could have a profound effect on, on the military, an effect on uh, suicides, all, all sorts of things that we're trying to work to prevent. So that's my 15 minutes, and I'll leave it there. And if anyone wants to pursue anything, questions, uh, be happy to uh, help you out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for that, that excellent presentation. And I really appreciated you bringing in the moral context and saying that, you know, the F-35s are really designed for bombing. And they also represent our Canadian identity as, as fighters instead of peacekeepers and peace builders. And this is why it's so important for us to, to change you know, the course of, of our national security and defense policy. And it was so hopeful as well for me to hear you say at the end, 
about nonviolent de defense policy and departments of peace. And I that's what I want to imagine and I want to build. And I want to also let everybody know that Paul wrote two excellent open letters to the defense minister, Anita Anand, one last year and then one uh, this year, just after her announcement on January 9th. And you can see that open letter on our website, nofighterjets.ca. So now I am going to turn uh, to introduce uh, Jimmy Lees. He has opposed the F-35s in the United States for a very long time, since 2010. And he founded the F-35 news report, cancel f35.substack.com. Jimmy is not only a peace activist, but he is also an attorney and he has wide, been widely published in places like Truth Out, Counterpunch and the Vermont Law Review. He is currently running for city council in South Burlington, Vermont, uh, which features opposition to the F-35 training flights from the airport in the city that are um, you know, causing a lot of problems for the residents there. And you can find out more about his political campaign at jimmylees.com, and Maya will put that in the chat. So Jimmy, please feel free to take it away now. Thank, thanks very much, Tamara. And it was a very excellent talk by Paul as well. Um, here in Vermont, we have 21 F-35 fighter jets. Um, I was just going to start my timer, so I can't do it. OK, we have 21 of these fighter jets. And it's, uh, it's really a nightmare for people living in the flight path. Um, they're conducting hundreds of training flights every month from a runway within the most densely populated part of the city of South Burlington. But South Burlington isn't the only city that's being hurt. The runway aims at two other cities, Winooski and Burlington, both among the largest cities in the state, along with South Burlington. And, uh, and there are 11 issues that I'm gonna talk about very quickly that make the training with the F-35 in densely populated cities illegal, immoral, and unjust. The first one is democracy denied. The F-35 jets were foisted on these Vermont cities three years ago in September of 2019. And it was against the will of the people as expressed in town meeting referendum type votes in both Burlington and Winooski. Winooski's vote actually was in 2021 after almost two years, a year and a half of the Jets being here. But the Burlington vote was in 2018. In Burlington, the, uh, the motion to cancel the F-35 basing at the city's airport, uh, one with 55% of the vote. And in Winooski, it won with 67% of the vote. But democracy was ignored. And how can you be fighting for democracy? How can, what, what is the purpose of our army in so many places and our Air Force when they just ignore the vote of the people affected. The second point is the extreme noise is demolishing health and safety for thousands of people in the flight path. The Air Force itself told us in its environmental impact statement that repeated exposure to the 115 decibel F-35 can cause hearing loss. About 130 decibels is enough for one exposure to cause hearing loss, immediate hearing loss from a single exposure. 115, it takes multiple exposures. But this is happening hundreds of, there are hundreds of training flights a month at this high, extreme high level in a city. It's an insane thing to be experimenting with. The Air Force also said, in addition to hearing damage, that it can impair the learning and the cognitive development 
of children. So we have an elementary school 800 yards from the runway with 550 children from preschool through fifth grade, right there in the noise zone of the F-35. The Air Force said that exposure to noise at this level can cause deficits in reading, memory, concentration, verbal skills, and math. Why are we doing this to our children? <clears throat> We've received more than 1,500 written detailed complaints of pain, injury, trauma, and suffering from people throughout the noise zone of the F-35. 657 Vermonters submitted, signed on to a 62-page complaint to the Inspector General of the Vermont Air National Guard that's conducting this training, these training flights. But it's not just hearing and cognitive development of children as described by the Air Force. There are more damaging things happening to the bodies of the people in the noise zone that were omitted from the Air Force documents, the Air Force Environmental Impact Statement. Recent peer-reviewed articles show significantly elevated risk of vascular harm, including heart disease and stroke from repeated exposure to aircraft noise. And the harm increases with the noise level. And one of the most extreme noise levels is that of the F-35 training flights. It's not good for children and other living things. The third issue is also related to the noise and it has to do with housing, housing loss, housing degradation. Hundreds of affordable homes were demolished ne near the airport because of military jet noise. It was the predecessor of the F-35, the F-16. In preparation for the environmental impact statement, just two years before anything was announced about the F-35 in 2008, the F-16 suddenly started using its afterburner for takeoff. It never had to do that for the previous um, uh, 15 years of training from the Burlington Airport or, or previous 20 years from, of training. Suddenly in 2008, it was using, and then we found out when the environmental impact statement came out that the comparison is with what's called the baseline noise level. So it became obvious that what had oh, happened no. was- Oh no, Jimmy, we've just lost you. You just lost me. Can no more hearing me? I can hear him. Oh. I hear you, I hear him perfectly. Oh, I'm sorry, it was mine. I think <laughs> I, I've got, I've become frozen. Sorry, Jimmy, please go ahead. Oh, okay. So I was just saying, that the um, the F-35 noise level, I think I was talking about, uh, was, uh, was preceded by this F-16, where they vastly increased the noise by turning on the afterburner for takeoff. Now, the afterburner is about five times louder than normal takeoff noise for the F-16. And that's about the noise level of the F-35 without the afterburner. So that increased the baseline noise level in the area near the airport. And so it made it easier to compare the F-35 with the baseline noise level. It was, a, it was a shrewd thing to do, but really not to the credit of the people who did it because it was deception. Now. It's not just, okay, so hundreds of houses were demolished in the, in the noise zone of the, F, uh, uh, in, in this intense noise zone. And it's about five miles long. It's an oval shaped, it's an oval shaped area around the runway. So you can imagine the runway is about a mile and a half long and about two more miles at each end is the extreme noise zone of the F-35. And it's only about a half mile on each side of the runway. So it's about one mile by five miles is this extreme noise zone of the F-35. Now you could have, there are many places 
in America, where a zone of that size is remote from any populated area. But the, the brilliant people in the Air Force and in the Vermont political establishment chose the most densely populated part of Vermont. We have, a, that's about 2,500 acres in this intense noise zone. Well, there are 7,000 people living in that noise zone. There are th nearly 3,000 units of housing in that noise zone and 1,300 children living in this intense 115 decibel oval shaped noise danger zone near the runway. That's how close housing is to the runway in Vermont. It was a small airport. It was not designed and built. It was built for, okay, so for much quieter aircraft, not the noisiest aircraft in the US Air Force inventory. So what we've got is extreme damage. It's to the point where the Air Force itself said that the houses in this 2,500 acre area are, uns are considered not suitable for residential use. You shouldn't be living there. It's dangerous for your health and safety. And in addition to that, we had hundreds of houses demolished because uh, at a, a certain point, the, air the airport sought grants from the Federal Aviation Administration. They purchased these hundreds of houses, demolished them, moved the people away in, in order to protect them from the noise. That's how bad it was. Well, now we have a housing crunch in Vermont. There's not enough housing. It's to the point where even employers are very concerned about housing for, for their employees because they're trying to expand business and employees who they give offers to come to visit and try to find a place for their family and they can't find one. So the, the housing situation is being hurt because all of this land and housing has been taken out of safety, okay, or even existence. 44 acres is, is a place for hundreds of houses. The fourth issue is the, in, is the incredibly disproportionate impact on low income and minority populations. That's the wording used by the Air Force itself. No rich, wealthy neighborhoods are in the noise zone. It's all working class people. It's all black indigenous and people of color and white workers. <laughs> this is class and race warfare. And it's directed against low income and minority Vermonters. The fifth item is crash. Now, there's a, this is a new airplane, relatively new airplane. It doesn't yet have a million fleet flight hours after all the years that it's been in development and in operation. When the previous plane came to Vermont, the F-16, it had over a million fleet flight hours for the whole fleet. It had over 70 crashes. The Air Force had learned a lot from all of those accidents. And so the F-16 never had an accident when it was in Vermont. Well, the F-35 isn't in that category. It didn't have that many fleet flight hours. It hasn't had that many crashes. It's a much more immature aircraft. And, and so it has is expected to have a high crash rate. In fact, it had a crash in Florida about a month ago. But it's not just the crash rate, it's also the crash consequences. The F-16 was made of aluminum. It had an aluminum body, it didn't burn. The F-35 is a carbon composite plane. When it crashes, it's not just the fuel that burns the th thousands of gallons of fuel, it's also the plane itself that's gonna catch fire in that fuel fire. But okay, the fuel burns and it turns into, into water and carbon dioxide. But the carbon-based plane itself Dozens of toxic chemicals come out. Even the one that uh, that uh, was a factor in killing people in Bhopal in India 
about 30 years ago. This is a mixture, and it's a mixture of toxic chemicals and uh, fibers and particulates. Jimmy, if you could wrap up in the next minute or two, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so the, the one more thing. I'm up to number six out of 11, but we'll end after this one. The F-35 is a nuclear bomb delivery vehicle. It's designed for the purpose of delivering two B-61-12 nuclear bombs. The uh, eight of these F-35 jets from Vermont went across the ocean to do what they called air policing in Eastern Europe during the summer. They policed around the borders of Russia. They're designed for a stealth attack at supersonic speed to drop nuclear bombs and to, and to, uh, and that's their purpose. They're not, as Paul pointed out, for protect, uh, protecting the borders or anything like that. And so because of that, it makes our cities a legitimate military target and uses cities full of civilians as human shields. One final thing, if I have a, a half a minute, is to say that the F-35 is a monster for greenhouse gas emissions. It burns 22 gallons a minute. Every, se every three seconds, it burns a gallon of jet fuel. It's a climate catastrophe on steroids. This is a danger for any place in the world. And the fact that the US government and the state of Vermont are collaborating on doing this in a city means wherever this is being put, the military is not, it doesn't even care for Vermonters, doesn't care for American citizens. It's not going to care for you, no matter where you are in the world. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy, thank you so much for your important uh, points. Your presentation was just excellent, and I'm hoping that you can share your notes with us so that we can get all 11 points. And for those of you who are on the call who aren't aware, Canada's largest and busiest Air Force base is in Cold Lake, Alberta, and it is and it is uh, built in a location where it is surrounded by uh, three uh, Dene and Cree reserves. And so it's the indigenous people that are going to be uh, suffering under the extreme noise of this new fleet of fighter jets. And I have been up there twice in the past a year and a half, um, warning them of this um, impending uh, fleet coming their way. And I don't think that the federal government has adequately consulted with them. So uh, now I would like to um, introduce uh, Danica Katovic. She is Code Pink's National Code Director, and she is leading Code Pink's campaign, Ground the F-35. Danica graduated from DePaul University with a bachelor's degree in political science in November of 2020. And since 2018, she has been working towards ending US participation in the war in Yemen and wars all over the world. At Code Pink, she also works as uh, the youth outreach uh, facilitator um, of the Peace Collective. Um, which is Code Pink's youth cohort that focuses on anti-militarist education and divestment. Danica, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm super honored to be here with you all today and really happy to be partnering with folks from Canada working um, against their government's purchase of F-35s, just because I'm in the U.S. working against my government's funding of the F-35 F program as a whole. So we can't win without each other. So that's super important. Um, I want to thank Paul for emphasizing that it's not impossible to cancel a large weapons purchase, um, just because we're sort of operating here in the U.S. off the same logic that Similarly, um, large weapons projects and programs have been canceled here in the U.S. before. Um, so, and the F-35 finds itself under similar circumstances today. Um, so members of Congress are kind of turning against the program. Uh, the former head of the House Armed Services Committee referred to it as a rat hole um, one time. Uh, also, we're sort of slipping into a recession here in the U.S., which 
Um, both of those sort of um, <clears throat> conditions is how the F-22 program came to an end here in the U.S. Um, so how do we stop the world's largest weapons program, the F-35, um, is certainly a feat. Um, but I want to talk about why Code Pink has started this campaign. And it's because the F-35 is sort of a microcosm of the military industrial complex. Um, it's expensive. It's a waste of taxpayer dollars um, here in the US. It doesn't do much to keep us safe. Um, it's bad for the environment um, and all of these things. And so we found it to be an achievable, achievable goal to shoot for. If we can scratch at the F-35 budget, we can scratch the Pentagon budget. Um, Biden's last budget, defense budget proposal that came out um, in 2022 for 2023 fiscal year, for the fiscal year, um, he requested funding for less F-35s than he was scheduled to. Um, so we believe that uh, scratching at the F-35 program for that reason is a um, achievable goal, something to work for here in the U.S., um, <clears throat> and it's also something that a lot of different folks can get upset about. Um, do you hate government waste? The F-35 is a waste of taxpayer dollars. It's nine years behind uh, schedule, and it's come with crashes um, and a whole bunch of other um, issues. Maintenance costs is only skyrocketing. Um, do you care about climate change? As Jimmy stated, um, the F-35 uses an immense amount of fuel per hour. It uses way more than its predecessor. Um, <clears throat> it also carries nuclear weapons, which if you, anyone would believe it, nuclear weapons, not great for the environment. Um, do you care about sound pollution and um, communities here in the U.S.? That the F-35 is harming, like Jimmy highlighted, that is happening in Vermont and is likely to start happening in Madison, Wisconsin very soon. Um, do, you care about, do you care about human rights violations? The F-35 is used by the state of Israel to um, bomb the people of Gaza, and Gaza is the world's <clears throat> largest open air prison. Um, Palestinians cannot escape while Israel um, assaults its people. Um, and in 2021 and in 2014, F-35s um, sold to Israel by the United States, war used in aerial bombardments of Gaza. Um, so that is that is why Code Pink started the Ground the F-35 campaign. And in October of last year, so a few months ago, we released a letter signed by two almost 230 organizations from all over the world. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat so you can all look at it. And it comes with a list of all the endorsing organizations. We have <clears throat> a bulk of organizations are from the U.S. We have um, the No Fighter Just Coalition organizations are signed on to the letter. Um, so ca Canadian organizations, German organizations, organizations in Switzerland and Latin America, and all over the world. Um, also Yemeni and Palestinian organizations. Um, so we released that in October as, as sort of a way of convening um, our organizations to work together. And now what we're doing is, for example, tomorrow, we're doing this every Friday um, to counter Lockheed Martin, the uh, manufacturer of this uh, fighter jet, the F-35, um, has what they call fighter jet Fridays on social media, where they kind of like boast and promote the F-35. So we have ground the F-35 Fridays, um, and you all can take part as an organization or as an individual. Uh, we're just asking people to use the hashtag ground the F-35 on Fridays. Um, so I'm, put, I'm putting a link to a social media toolkit in the chat. Um, I update it weekly. Hopefully it's easy to use and explain sort of our methodology a little bit. Um, but we're trying to do that every Friday and Code Pink comes out with educational TikToks every Friday as well. Um, tomorrow, I made one on Canada's purchase of the F-35. So I'll be highlighting, um, you know, an article actually Tamara wrote um, about Canada's purchase of F-35s. Um, <clears throat> So we're doing that on social media every Friday. We're also encouraging organizations um, in our coalition and in individuals to do canvases in their communities, postcarding. We have Canadian and US um, postcards. Um, 
wheat pasting, letter writing and call-in parties. We did a letter writing to Congress, uh, letter writing party to Congress last week, um, where we're hand delivering people's letters to their member of Congress about canceling the F-35 program. Um, also call-in parties um, <clears throat> and such. I'm also, Code Pink will also be organizing a lobby day um, for people in the U.S. to reach out to their members of Congress, set up meetings about canceling the program. Um, and we're doing this at sort of an important political moment um, because uh, in December, in mid-December, there was a F-35 crash in Texas where the uh, pilot was ejected from the plane and injured. Um, they survived, but it, they were in the hospital for a couple of days, I believe. And so um, engine, they suspected there was an issue with the engine. And so all of the engine deliveries are suspended, which means production has essentially, essentially halted, which might affect the Canadian purchase of F-35s. If they're not able to produce any more F-35s, I don't know if Canada will be able to get all the ones they purchased. Um, as also new F-35 purchases may um, be delayed. And also the Department of Defense um, may have delayed F-35 production for another year, uh, potentially because of issues with the new simulator that Lockheed Martin has just not been able to get right. Um, for safety reasons, they are delaying that. And then Biden is also going to release his new uh, defense budget proposal for fiscal year of 2024. And so we're hoping that with enough pressure leading up to that, um, including a week of action at the end of March where we have actions going on in 10 cities and I'm hoping to get up to 20 um, by mid-March, um, we can ramp up pressure to the Biden administration to request um, at least um, less money for the F-35 and maybe none. Um, but yeah, so that is what we're up to. I'm really, really happy to be working with orgs across the world on this issue because like I said earlier, we can't really win without each other. I know our demands might seem different. Um, you know, you're asking your government not to buy F-35s. I'm asking my government not to produce anymore. Um, but if the demand is low for F-35s around the world, um, that also helps our mission um, here in the United States. So um, I'll put my email in the chat if anyone wants to collaborate more, if anyone has any questions about what Code Pink is doing, but um, you can go to Code Pink's website. Um, you can also sign the letter and add your name as an individual. We will be going to every congressional office delivering those uh, letters with signatures on it, and they can be, uh, you can be from wherever in the world to sign that um, letter. So thank you. That was awesome, Danica. Thank you so much. And I am so pleased that our Canadian No Fighter Jets Coalition is partnering with Code Pink on this international campaign to ground the F-35s. We are going to win by working together. And your activism is always so creative and powerful. So it's so great that we are connected. And I like that you mentioned that weapon systems can be terminated. I'm reminded that 20 years ago, New Zealand uh, canceled its plans to buy combat aircraft and new warships. And if New Zealand can do it, we can do it. And I also want to remind people that right now the federal government is asking for submissions on budget 2023. So this will be the time to let your member of parliament and to contribute to that process to say you want defense spending reduced and you want the F-35 and the warships canceled and uh, invest, invested in all of these important things like healthcare, affordable housing that we need. So our next uh, and final presenter is uh, Brent Patterson. He is a leading um, activist in our No Fighter Jets Coalition. He's a longtime peace activist and community organizer, and he's a writer based in Ottawa. I want to encourage you to follow his excellent Twitter account. Um, Maya will put that in the chat, and he is going to let us know about next steps in this Canadian campaign. Take it over. Take it away, uh, Brent. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Great. Thanks, Tamara. Um, thank you to, uh, to everyone. Um, I'm so glad for this conversation. Um, I guess to share in terms of the next steps that that we are thinking of, it, it's really um, a continual process, and it is in terms of listening to uh, people like Paul and James and Donica and and gathering that analysis and that information and thinking about the possibilities and and developing strategies and tactics out of that. So this evening has already been uh, really helpful in in continuing to refine and and define the uh, our next uh, steps. Um, I'll try and say five main things that we're um, thinking about or will be doing, and then a couple uh, odds and ends within, I guess, the five minutes or so that I have. Uh, first of all, uh, we very much want to join the uh, ground, the F-35 uh, Friday. So that's number one, thinking that it's it's really important to be visible on social media and visible on the streets in front of MP offices and other, other places uh, so that uh, it's clear to people across the country that there's a, a growing and popular movement against the, the F-35, against the, uh, the, the purchase of, uh, of this warplane. Uh, secondly, uh, also looking at ways that we can connect with um, Lead Now and international uh, actions is uh, in April, we would expect that there's going to be a week of action uh, against uh, Lockheed Martin at the time of their annual shareholders meeting. We would see, again, that as an important time to, to visibilize this struggle through, um, through a variety of ways. So for those who are um, thinking about connecting into this, um, this, this campaign, um, keep, that, uh, keep that in mind. Um, I think two uh, point three, third third thing, is uh, is we're wanting to make uh, this this movement, this campaign, as intersectional as possible. So connecting with different different movements and different um, uh, organizations. I think some of this has come up um, in some of the presentations already, but certainly wanting to connect with uh, Indigenous land defenders, Indigenous rights activists, the Cold Lake um, Air Force Base, uh, as Tamara was saying, is on uh, uh, Dene Cree uh, territory. There have been land defense um, actions, struggles in years past against, against that base, and we should be thinking about the impact of those fighter jets on, on um on those territories in terms of James talking about uh, the impact on, on populations. It certainly would have an impact on the city, the, the reserves, uh, nature and wildlife. And we, we want to be articulating uh, that, connecting more with the environmental movement, ideally with 350 Greenpeace and other organizations like that. We would really like to draw them um, into this uh, campaign. I think I have it ready here, and I'll I'll put as well too, just because I know that we have our parliamentary uh, petition, which I really encourage you to sign. But uh, Lead Now, which is a leading activist organization uh, in uh, this country, also has a petition against the F thirty five. Like to involve them more uh, uh, in this in this work. Um, fourth, building a popular base. Um, to exert pressure on the government and members of, of parliament. We're in a difficult situation right now where um, we have 338 members of parliament, perhaps three of them who um, have either spoken out or are somewhat critical of the, of the, the purchase. So um, the two members of the Green Party some within with the NDP uh, expressing some concern. So we have a long way to go to really build uh, a parliamentary opposition, a critical parliamentary opposition to this this deal. So really needing to focus on building the popular base to push those members of parliament to take um, uh, a better position than they have. Fifth point that I wanted to raise, it's just there's also the things if we had some money what we would like to like to uh, like to be doing um, and so as we build some of our fundraising campaigns some of the bigger ticket items might be looking at 
how we get um, a larger advertisement in a in a mainstream uh, newspaper, so we can reach more people with our uh, with our uh, messaging. We've also talked talked, which is much less expensive than a newspaper, but about doing a poll, um, just so that we can say with some confidence whatever, 70%, 80%, whatever, of, of Canadians uh, have a concern about this um, this fighter jet purchase. Um, I'll take one more minute, if I might, uh, and just um, also say again to encourage people on this in, in this call to connect with us, and we'll put a link or an email in the chat to um, uh, to, to connect with, with the coalition. Um, but as we're out on the streets, we're already kind of hearing the, well, we need the F-35 for Arctic defense, or we need the F-35 because of our NATO NORAD commitments, whatever. Um, and not to go into the back and forth on that tonight, and some of that's already been covered, but wanting to produce a, basically a they say, we say fact sheet. So concise responses to those kinds of arguments that we hear quite often from those who uh, support this purchase. Uh, we have in mind uh, the Parliamentary Budget Office uh, report that's coming um, out in this spring. Already the Department of National Defense has said that the, the lifespan cost of the fighter jet purchase will be in the 70 billion range. We produced a report three years ago that said it was in the 77 billion dollar range. We'll see what the Parliamentary Budget Office um, comes up with, but we think that that's an important argument that will be resonating with people. We are working with the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is, puts out an alternative federal budget. They'll be putting one out uh, in November. That's that's basically um, the movement, social movement, saying to the government, here's the better way to spend Money. Their position last year, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Alternative Federal Budget, was that the fighter jet purchase should be scrapped and that the, the billion should be put elsewhere. We'll be supporting that uh, effort and, and reiterating that message uh, in November. Um, lots of other things, but I think I'm out of time. But maybe just the last, last thing uh, to mention is um, we're also uh, mobilizing uh, May 1st May 31st, June 1st, for the CANSEC Arm Show that happens in Ottawa. One of the main sponsors of that is Lockheed Martin. In the past, they've had the F-35 there, or, or mock-up of it, that kind of thing, or of other fighter jets. We want to have a very clear and strong presence uh, at that arm show to say that we're um, resisting this purchase, we're resisting uh, militarism, we're in favor of building uh, peace, and, uh, and, and we see that as part of the campaign. So I feel that was very quick, but probably uh, too long, but just wanted to, to, to give you a flavor of some of the things that we'll be engaging in and to encourage you to, to join this, this campaign with us. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brent, for all of those excellent and inspiring ideas. There's lots of ways for people to get involved. We encourage you to check out our website, nofighterjets.ca, and also to follow and share our work on social media. You can uh, find our handle there in the chat. And uh, we're going to turn now to the question and answer period. We have about... Uh, uh, just under uh, 20 minutes for that. And I'm going to combine a comment and a question. And I know this has been addressed a little bit by our speakers, but I think this is really an important question to raise and to answer because it's something that we are confronted with all of the time. And this question is, so Ru the Russians have equivalent warplanes and the Chinese have advanced uh, fighter jets. Uh, we have commitments to NATO and NORAD that we need to fulfill. We also need these warplanes to defend ourselves and the free world. Um, we should keep these fighter jets, not uh, cancel the procurement. So. Uh, does Paul or James or Danica, uh, would you like to respond to, to that question? 
I, I can give each yeah, of you sure. a, a minute or two to answer that question because it's really an important one. And thanks, Jim, for raising it in the chat. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that you have to ask yourself is um, Canada is probably in, in the world one of the most blessed from the point of uh, security, uh, military security. We're protected by three oceans. So then the, then the question leads to be, how can we contribute to international peace and, and, and stability and security? And the answer is, we don't have to do everything. I mean, what we can do is to say, there's no reason, one of the most difficult things to bring in, into a, a theater war in the Middle East is a squadron of six uh, F-18s or F-35s. Because the next thing you know, everything is grounded back in Canada as you start to steal parts, and it's horrifically expensive uh, because we're duplicating what everyone else has. So that's the problem. And I think the big question is, is that we do not need to contribute F-35s uh, to be a participant in NATO if we want to assume collective defense as, as something uh, to Canadians. We can contribute humanitarian aid. We can contribute troops that do uh, protection of uh, refugees and uh, safe havens and uh, many, many other things that we can contribute uh, as, as, as part of NATO. It's not necessary to, to do that. And if we want to do something else, we have massive uh, transports in which uh, we can move things around for disaster relief. And also we can contribute to sort of naval naval operations or, or or even putting troops on the ground when you're getting into ceasefire uh, um, um, peacekeeping type type of issues issues that are going to be more constabulary rather than rather than search and destroy you're going to do uh, you know um, a protection uh, a protection and defense kind kind of operations so there is a distinction between peace operations and war fighting operations. And we have to make that distinction. We do not need to contribute F F thirty fives. It's not a given. Yeah, I... thank you, Paul. Yes, and Danica and and Jimmy, you probably uh, are faced with this in the United States a lot. Please uh, uh, share. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say is, if we want to stop or prevent a war, I think especially um, between like the NATO countries and and Russia specifically. Sending a nuclear capable fighter jet to the situation would only escalate it um, and make it more dangerous for everyone. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. And also just like technically, the US recently announced that they weren't gonna send, I forgot what kind of fighter jet, it wasn't an F-35, like maybe F-16s or 18s or something. Um, we weren't going to send them to Ukraine um, and the reasoning behind it was they take forever to learn how to use and train. Like it wouldn't even make sense to send them to Ukraine. They would take months to years to learn how to use for the Ukrainian um, military. So that's why the U.S. isn't sending uh, fighter jets. And if you send F-35s to Ukraine right now, like I don't even know what they would do. Nothing probably at all, except escalate the situation. Yeah. And you're right. The F-35 is, is not a nuclear bomber. It has a capability because you have to bring the bombs into theater also. And that's extremely visible. Uh, we know all the countries who have them and we know where all the bases are. So it's 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 another issue. Uh, Jimmy, would you like to respond to that question yes. as well? Yeah, I would just Thanks. say I just was reminded of us, uh, Martin Luther King's remark back in 1967 during the Vietnam War, that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And at that time, we were uh, using napalm and white phosphorus and carpet bombing in a tiny country of Vietnam. And we've been involved in war after war since then, many of them based on lies. And really, very little good has come out of it. It's only killed millions of people and maimed and wounded so many thousands of our own soldiers. The, the United States cannot be trusted to be a force for peace in the world. Uh, the best way uh, for us as peace activists is to call for uh, abolishing NATO, abolishing the US intervention, no more regime change wars, no more interventions in other countries. The U.S. is very sensitive that somebody might, that the Russians might have 
uh, intervened in our election. We're intervening in every aspect of life in so many other countries. This has all got to stop. We've got to do some rethink, big rethink, and really take into account what Martin Luther King said. I agree. I agree as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Jimmy and Paul and Danica for those excellent uh, answers. And uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes left for question and answers. And I'm going to turn it over to Maya who has collected some more questions and she's going to pose them to our panelists. Maya, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much Tamara and thank you so much to all of you for your wise words. Um, I'd like to bring up a question that Patsy wrote in the chat uh, a few minutes ago, um, asking folks to speak maybe to, you know, the, the idea that fighter jets are bought to secure the Arctic. Um, this is something we hear a lot in this campaign, especially from the Canadian point of view. Um, so I was wondering if I, any of our panelists wanted to speak to that argument that we hear so often. Uh, what was the question? Um, what would you say to folks that say that fighter jets are necessary to secure the Arctic? I'll put the question in the chat as well. Okay. Well, it, it's not a question of them being necessary or not necessary. I mean, we, we have many ways in which we protect the Arctic, I guess. And uh, we have uh, patrol aircraft, which are not fighter jets, the big Aurora type aircrafts that go around with a lot of sensors. Uh, we're moving into the age where if you want to keep track of what's going on up there, where drones will probably um, uh, take over and in reconnaissance and surveillance and land management and a hundred other things. Uh, the fighter jets are a very, very uh, expensive way to do that. And you may want to, when I was in NORAD, the biggest job we had was an aircraft would take off from Columbia full of drugs. The Americans would track it and then it would try to duck into Canada and we would chase them around with fighter jets and, until we figured out where they were landing and then you call the RCMP and they come in and, and uh, with helicopters. So there, there are some constabulary issues that you, you know you might need some some speed, but you do not need uh, F-35s to, to do that. We're not in the business of uh, shooting down anybody, even if it's Russian bombers that are testing the, uh, uh, the airspace. You know, there was a lot of that going on, but it was, it was relatively benign and uh, uh, the game went both ways. Uh, my biggest fear was after the Cold War, and I was in the Pentagon a little one, and I heard something that was quite disturbing. Uh, a lot of the, the officers there were, were a little bit upset when the Warsaw Pact collapsed. And one of the comments made that, that I heard made was they're not keeping up their end of the threat. In other words, there's a great game going on. It's all sorts of adventure and, and, and things like this. And, and they were willing to propagate that. And uh, so that kind of thinking has to has to uh, has to stop. Uh, Jimmy or Danica, would you like to say anything about the F thirty fives in the Arctic? Maybe what people are thinking up in Alaska about the F thirty fives, the the experience there of F thirty fives being flown or uh, tested there. I don't have anything to add to what Paul said. I think that comes. Same. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, Maya, do you have any other questions that you'd like to pose? Um, yeah, I'll hop in here. Um, Anne asked, it, asked a really important question, which is, um, are there campaigns to try to reinstate non-proliferation and similar treaties to limit the numbers and use of weapons of mass destruction? Um, and I think that while Anne posed this question regarding weapons of mass destruction, I think maybe we could also expand this question to consider what other campaigns do we know of or are we linked to aside from, you know, the, the cross-border U.S.-Canada efforts here um, in other countries or other regions of the world trying to oppose, you know, massive warplanes such as the F-35. And I'll put Anne's question in the chat um, so it's easier to, to see there, but perhaps folks would like to speak to that. Yeah, maybe. Oh, uh, Paul, would you like to say something? And for sure, Danica, you could talk about the international campaign as well. Paul, please go ahead. Thanks. Yes, the internet. There are very strong campaigns with regards to uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, the biggest one that, that is most recent is the TPNW, Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. 
of which the United States refused to sign. And for some reason, uh, uh, Canada and Israel and a bunch of countries were just in lockstep. Every time this arises, uh, there is a group of, of countries that, that oppose it. I think you can't keep the pressure. You have to keep the pressure on. I mean, the biggest killer of people, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do something like this, is small arms. The AK-47 and whatnot kills roughly 2,000 people a day you know, in, in, in the world. And there are, uh, there's a whole escalatory list of things and campaigns that people um, uh, are doing and working towards, and uh, we see how it goes. Danica, would you like to share a little bit about the connections that you've made internationally on this campaign and anything else you'd like to say about the nuclear weapons aspect? Um, I don't really work on like the issue of uh, nuclear weapons at Code Pink, um, but what I will say is our partners in Europe, um, when we talk to them about the F-35, um, and as it relates to the war in Ukraine specifically, um, they're very, very worried about F-35 sales um, to European countries because of uh, NATO and because of the possibility of nuclear war with Russia. Um, so I will say that is that comes up a lot in our work with our European partners on the ground of the F-35 campaign. And Jimmy, anything else to add? Yes. the. The new treaty that Paul mentioned is uh, a, a continuation or it expands upon the existing treaty, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now that treaty, almost everybody knows that that treaty is supposed to prevent more countries from acquiring nuclear weapons. But it also has a provision that those countries that have nuclear weapons are supposed to get rid of them. So that's already something the US has signed, but ignores. And, um, and so the US is all, another, but it's, this isn't the only treaty that the US isn't conforming to. The, the assault that, that I was talking about on Vermonters with the F-35, violates multiple treaties like the fourth geneva convention they're attacking civilians with that and the u.s prides itself or the u.s military prides itself on going beyond the requirements of international law of treaties that the u.s has signed by saying we're going to enforce those not just during military conflicts but also in all circumstances well, all circumstances includes training with F-35 jets in Vermont, and they're not conforming. They're hurting civilians. They're targeting civilians. So I think that these treaties are terrific, but they have to be enforced. And the U.S. is in the leadership in not enforcing international laws and treaty obligations, unfortunately. So that that's that's the key issue. I mean, the issue of having all of these treaties, of which the U.S. is in violation of, uh, speaks to the fact that there is no accountability. U.S. does not sign on to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, or the ICJ, uh, the International Court of Justice. So there is no there is no mechanism to bring accountability to this uh, uh, these issues, and the only way you get by it is the issue of power. The United States has just tremendous power that they can they can do this. Violations of, of laws of armed conflict and their invasion in Iraq, for example, uh, and what was done in, in various components, they were very, very quick, you know, very, very quick to uh, uh, point fingers at Russia and all sorts of other things uh, when we do the same the same thing. Or, or you know, how, how, does, how does one even uh, bring accountability to Russia in this situation? I mean, this this is a terrible situation. Uh, yes, and just to add to what the uh, presenters just said, you know, Canada is not joining the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, this important new treaty, because of our membership in, in NATO. And so Canadians need to think critically about our continued participation in this U.S.-led nuclear armed military alliance. And I, 
I think we have time for one quick question because we need to wrap up in 10 minutes. So uh, Maya, I will check with you to see if there was another question or comment that you flagged in the chat and we can bring to our attention of our panelists. I think we ended up covering a lot of the issues that folks were asking about. So I think we're good to move on. Thank you all so much. Okay, so I will uh, see if the speakers would like to share any closing uh, comments. I'll give them uh, one minute each. And I'll, uh, uh, if you have any uh, further uh, comments to make, uh, please take a minute and we'll go in the order, uh, starting with Paul and then Jimmy and then Danica, and then we'll turn the floor over to Akila, who will share some upcoming events. Paul, is there anything that you'd like to say to wrap up in the next minute? Well, I, I would say dealing dealing with the issue, we have to begin by dealing with the, the, the meta issue around the F-35. If we are going to hit the intractable part, um, we're probably not going to get too far. And one of the main solutions that I would see is if we can somehow insert a Department of Peace as a precursor uh, and mandate, strictly mandate the use of peace operations before, before you have any justification whatsoever for invoking the laws of armed conflict. And there are many, many uh, um, sophisticated models that, uh, that can do this. That's excellent. I totally agree. Uh, Jimmy? So I think this event tonight is a terrific uh, beginning or continuation of efforts to build an international peace movement. Uh, that's what's needed is to mobilize and make visible and have days of action, international days of action uh, against these wars and against the armament industry and against the militarization of societies and states and countries. Uh, we, we need to be uh, organizing independently and organizing actions where people can participate uh, together and unified and worldwide. I think uh, there's nothing that's more inspiring to me than seeing an action between so many peace groups in Canada and those of us in the United States. And hopefully we'll uh, expand. I, I heard some talk about peace groups in Europe and around the world. This is, this is how we can confront this and, and put the greatest pressure on to build the uh, mass movements around the world against this militarization. Uh, thank you so much, Jimmy. And Danica had to uh, step away. So we are now going to turn it over to Akila, uh, Vow's new peace intern, and she's a student at the University of Toronto. And uh, she can say a little bit about herself and also uh, let you know about upcoming events and things that you can help build the peace movement in Canada and help us get that Department of Peace that Paul was talking about that we so desperately need. So I'm going to share my screen and get Akila's slides up. And Akila, you could maybe begin by, um, by telling us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Tamara. And thank you to all of the speakers. You all did a fantastic job. Um, like Tamara was saying, I'm an intern at FAO at Voice of Women for Peace Canada, and I'm a student at the University of Toronto. I'm studying peace, conflict, and justice studies. And yeah, I'm just going to take a few minutes to highlight a couple of our upcoming events and campaigns. Um, the links to register should be put in the chat like as I go along. So please consider signing up. We would love to see you all there. And I also wanted to remind everyone to follow VOW on our social media accounts. Um, our handle is at VOW Peace for um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our website is also listed at the bottom there if you'd like to check it out and sign up for our monthly newsletters. Okay, so if I could switch the first slide. Um, the first event that I wanted to highlight is our upcoming panel discussion on Canada's role in the current crisis in Haiti. This event is being hosted by VOW. Um, it's also being hosted by the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILP, and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. 
and it will be taking place next Thursday from 7.30 until 9 p.m. Eastern time. So the same time that this webinar today took place. And if we could switch the next slide. So the panel will feature Elaine Briere. So she's the filmmaker of Haiti Betrayed and a special um, Haitian Canadian guest speaker who will discuss the current crisis and Canada's role, both past and present. Uh, we will also be joined by Gabby Paul, who's shown in the slide here. Gabby is a radio show host and a human rights activist from Haiti, as well as the founder and president of the Foundation Julia A. Jade, which works to empower Haitian women and farmers. Uh, this event is being held to remember the coup that was orchestrated by Canada, France, and the US against Haiti's democratically elected president and to demand accountability. It is also to mark Black History Month and to stand in solidarity with the people of Haiti. Uh, even if you aren't able to make the panel, we encourage everyone to watch the film, Haiti Betrayed. Um, it's available for free right now at www.foreignpolicy.ca. And the passcode is listed there as well. It's BH1915. And then the next event that I wanted to highlight is a webinar being held on Sunday, February 19th, which will discuss the war in Ukraine and NATO's role in perpetuating the conflict. Uh, this webinar is being organized by VOW alongside the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network and the um, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILF, and will feature speakers from Canada, the US, and Ukraine. Um, and then the next thing that I wanted to promote is our International Weekend of Action, Peace Now, Stop the War, Stop NATO, which is being organized by the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network, so VOW and WILP again. It will be taking place two weeks from today, so from Thursday, February 23rd, until Sunday, February 26th. And we encourage everyone to attend and help plan protests in your city, as well as attend online events, which will be held across Canada, the UK, and in other countries in Europe as well. And lastly, um, I wanted to remind everyone once again to please sign the parliamentary petition to call on the Trudeau government to drop the F-35 deal. Um, as Tamara shared at the beginning of the webinar, we're trying to get 2,000 signatures by March 6th. So please sign on, please share the petition with your friends and family on your social media, wherever you can. And yeah, that's all for me. So I'm gonna pass it back to Tamara for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Akila, And thank you to all of our panelists there was so much excellent information shared. I feel more empowered and inspired to stop these F-35s and to build the Department of Peace. Uh, let's stay connected. Uh, please get involved in our work. We really need you. And um, I want to let you know that Maya has uh, recorded this. It, there will be a follow-up email sent that will have some more resources for you and you'll be able to uh, share the recording. Um, so thank you again very much, everyone. Have a fantastic uh, rest of your evening and um, let's stay together working for peace. We can do it. Cancel the F-35s, ground the F-35s. Bye everyone.